All right, welcome to Computer Science E75, Building Dynamic Websites. My name is David Malin, and I will be your instructor this semester. This is lecture zero, DNS, HTTP, XHTML, and CSS. So tonight is ultimately not only about that stuff, but also about introducing the course to you and giving you a sense of what you've gotten yourselves into this semester. So this course is ultimately about building dynamic websites. So why don't we begin with just that. Uh, you want to put a website on the internet. What, in most cases, is the first thing that you need, presumably? All right, so you need a server. Uh, or even before you have a server, I'm going to argue that we want, right, the easiest thing to do when making the site is to start thinking of the name, right? Even if you guys have no idea how to do what it is you want to do this semester, odds are, especially if you've read the syllabus in advance or the course's description, you know that you're going to be getting a domain name in just a few hours for this course. So why don't we begin with precisely that step? How do you go about getting a domain name? Well, there's these things called registrars. And up till a few years ago, there was really only one place to get these things. These days, there's a whole bunch of competition. If you Google a term like uh, domain name registrar, you will get innumerable results, some more reputable than others. Odds are you can get a domain name for most any of them just fine. But uh, as you might have seen in the press recently, there's this uh, nefarious practice with some of these guys of, for instance, you search for foo.com, it's available, but that registrar, uh, a little bit uh, unbeknownst to you perhaps, decides to scoop that name up then upsells you by charging you, say, three times the cost. So perhaps the best rule of thumb to give you first tonight is at least start with someone reputable. The one we're going to preach in this course, only because it's one that we're all familiar with and it happens to be one of the biggest, uh, is called GoDaddy. I do not know the etymology of their name, but I imagine you can find it on Wikipedia or their website. But for now, let's go ahead and go over to their website at GoDaddy.com. So, this is probably a little overwhelming, and I actually wish there were a simpler, more reputable website that we could bring you, and I'm sure there actually is, but again, we'll stick with what, what we know here. So I want to go about buying a domain name. Turns out that nested inside of all these adverts on this page is this thing here, domain name search. So what's it going to be? What are we going to name our first website tonight? Give me something. I'm going to get an A. I'm gonna get an a dot com. All right, let's try that. So I'm gonna get an a dot com. I'm gonna go ahead and click go as you will for Project Zero, and turns out is it is available. Not only is the dot com available for nine ninety nine, we also can get the dot info, uh, the dot mobi, dot net, dot org, dot tv, and perhaps a bunch of other ones. And you'll see down below, and this really is how these registrars are making money these days. Uh, they they recommend some to you. Apparently, if I like that one, I might like my I'm gonna uh, get General Electric Anna dot com. <laughs> So I'm not quite sure where some of the permutations here go from. Oh, so GoSnowplowing.com is something I might like for $600, but I think we're letting ourselves get distracted too easily. So let's go back up. $9.99, uh, it's already checked for me, and here's one of the catches with GoDaddy. It's kind of hard to check out without buying something else. But nonetheless, know from tonight onward that you can click Continue to avoid all the upselling. Although if that weren't enough, maybe I want to get these great domains as well. I can add them for just $10. No, I'm going to click the much smaller link, notice, <laughs> called continue to check out. And now I can go ahead here and log in. So if I were to buy this thing at this point, I'd first create what they call a customer account. I'd give them my name, billing address, credit card information, and probably within another minute or two, I'd be done. I'd have checked out, and I now own I'm going to get an A.com. Well, now you own the domain. What are you going to do with it? What is the next step, either intuitively or if you know it already? All right, so we need, even that, we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. Fill it up with HTML. Well, where, how do I fill it up with HTML? What do I need first? All right, so we need a host. We need something called a web host. And now, actually, before we, uh, we overlook something that some of you might not be wholly familiar with, I actually did have some choices there a moment ago. And you notice we went immediately for the .com, which is perhaps uh, these days no longer necessarily indicative of a commercial enterprise. After all, what we're doing here isn't particularly commercial, and we could have bought a .com. But there are a whole bunch of other options, some of which I rattled off. But know tonight onward that 
in this system known as DNS, which we'll come back to in a bit tonight, you have a whole bunch of options these days for domain names, which is increasingly useful as it becomes increasingly difficult to find a good.com. Now, we happen to guess one off the top of our heads here just fine, but I mean, in a room full of about 100 people here, most of you will probably not get your first pick when it comes time to tackle Project Zero. Uh, are there any restrictions on some of these so called top level domains or TLDs? Clearly not on com, since apparently anyone can go buy one. Sorry, edu. So you actually have to be a uh, verified educational institution to buy edu. What other ones have some restrictions? Do you? All right, so .gov is pretty easy. Can't just go and get one of those. .mil is also restricted to the U.S. military. Uh, .org not restricted. So .net, .org, .com, and even .tv and a bunch of others are pretty unrestricted these days. And a good rule of thumb, frankly, is go to a site like GoDaddy, look at their little drop downs, and you'll see what the possible TLDs, top level domains, are for you. .us denotes a US address, uh, at least in theory. And then dot, dot, dot. Turns out there's a whole bunch of other TLDs known as CC TLDs or country code. TLDs, and it turns out that .tv should actually be on that list there. I mean, odds are a few minutes, a few moments ago, .tv probably conjured up what notion in your head? Television. All right, television, not the little Pacific Island nation known as Tuvalu, which is in fact the country that sold off effectively the rights to its country codes domain so that they could take advantage of the fact that much of the world thinks of TV as denoting television. So you too can buy a .tv site. In fact, as you'll see in a moment, even we, the course, have our own little .tv site just for the sexiness of it, but for no other reason. So those are the TLDs that you have access to. Well, let's assume we just went ahead and bought a .com. What do we do with it? Well, now you need what's called a web host. You need a place to put this domain name so that you can begin filling it, so to speak, with HTML, the language in which web pages are written. So how do we do this? Well, if you've never done this, odds are you might start fairly reasonably by going to Google and typing in uh, web host. And unfortunately, here too, you're going to be inundated with possible options, including in the ads on the right and the legitimate links at left. We got some more options up here. And this too is one of these areas these days where it's kind of hard, dare say, to find a good web host only because they tend to differ, yes, in price, but also really in terms of quality. Frankly, I had a domain name a few years ago. I think I actually owned mailin.net at the time. The .com was taken, and I, wanted, I didn't really care about this domain. I just wanted david at mailin.net to forward to my real email address. And I actually found a web host for $12 a year who was willing to do this for me, but there was one catch. What was that catch, do you think? Advertising in the email, good guess, but not in this case. No service level agreement, which is a fancy way of saying, didn't always get my email. <laughs> right? So you do sort of get what you pay for. But fortunately, the cheaper computer hardware gets, the cheaper bandwidth gets these days, the more you are truly getting for your money. So one of the sites, the web hosts that we were going to use in this course when the enrollment was about 40 a few weeks ago, and now we're 100, 110, 120, we realized we might need to um, pay for a bit more to make this all work, we were going to have us all use a site called DreamHost because this, like GoDaddy in the world of registrars, is a pretty reputable and pretty well-known web host. And you actually get a lot for your money. So just to contextualize the sort of stuff we're doing in this course, and this really isn't meant to be a sales pitch for any of these companies because sadly we get no share of anything here, if you go to DreamHost.com, they've actually whittled down all of their offerings to just one plan for apparently $5.95 per month. Kind of hard to beat that because what they'll give you with your account if you sign up with this company is, let's see, 500 gigabytes of storage space that apparently increases automatically by two gigabytes. Uh, you get five terabytes of bandwidth. That means if you're hosting really big files, you can, those can be transferred uh, totaling two, uh, five terabytes of data per month. You get unlimited MySQL databases, which is a type of database that we'll actually be using in the course. Uh, you get unlimited email accounts, unlimited shell, aka SSH, SFTP accounts, unlimited pop access, proc mail filtering, and I'm sort of rattling these off. If you don't know all of these, that's fine. You'll become uh, acquainted with most of them during the semester, but suffice it to say, you get a lot. 
But not from us, not from this particular host. We decided to take another approach and host things for you. So we actually get pretty much all of this and more within our own little sandbox environment, which I'll come back to in just a bit. But let's suppose now that I've settled on a host, maybe not DreamHost, but a little place called cs75.net to host my brand new website. What do I need to do to now put that domain name with that web host? Does anyone know? DNS. So I heard DNS. Not a bad uh, guess given that that's where we began here. So DNS, what does that mean? What do we need to inform the world of exactly? Yeah, so we need to d tell the registrar from which we bought this domain name what my so-called name servers are going to be. For the following reason, when you pull up a website, the typical transaction these days looks like this. So this is me sitting at my desktop computer. And here is my web host, which we will henceforth start calling cs75.net. And this is me over here. And I pull up a browser, and I type in I'm going to get an A.com. And I hit Enter. Well, how in the world does my computer, especially if I've never visited this website before, know where on the nebulous internet that website actually is? What's sort of the underlying answer here in a word? Yeah, so there's this transaction that goes on behind the scenes because Windows and Mac OS take care of this for me such that when I hit enter in my browser, having typed in I'm going to get an A.com and hit enter, Windows or Mac OS first contacts a local DNS server as it's called. And this is just some other computer that my computer is somehow connected to. And that server's sole purpose in life is to take domain names or host names like I'm going to get an A.com and convert them to these things called IP addresses. And most of you probably heard this term or seen this kind of number before. It's a number like 1.2.3.4. And an IP address in, is what? Internet protocol, but what does that mean? Uh, so it's like a phone number, or maybe in more literal terms, it's like an address, a postal address that uniquely identifies not a house in the world, but rather a computer on the internet. So every computer on the internet has an IP address, but it's much more convenient, frankly, for humans to remember computers by way of names, like I'm going to get an A.com, and the, instead of 1.2.3.4, which is much more arcane. So this server's purpose in life is to take in a request like, what's the IP address for I'm going to get an A.com, and return that answer. And that answer is going to be returned to my computer. My computer, namely my browser, can now request the web page, for instance, of I'm going to get an A.com because it knows its IP address. And then its data will get routed on the internet in a magic way for tonight's purposes. And then finally, the web page at I'm going to get an A.com comes back to me. Now, let's roll back here. What was that second step in the process we walked through before? We have the domain name. We now need a web host. Well, our web host, if not dream host, is going to be something like this server, which we'll start calling cs75.net, which is a box that we, the course, run as though it were a commercial web host, but only for you to use during the, uh, for the duration of the semester. So if your website, I'm going to get an A.com, is going to be hosted on our server, what should the IP address be of I'm going to get an A.com be? Yeah, actually the same address as our computer. So it turns out, thanks to this general system called DNS, which again translates names to addresses and back, you can actually have multiple names point to a single address. So our computer here, cs75.net, has some IP address like 1.2.3.4, but it's a little more interesting than that. But your domain and the person next to you's domain and the other person you met tonight's domain is all going to live on this server and thus all of your websites are going to have underneath the hood the same IP address. But in order for all of that to work, you need to tell somebody. You need to tell someone, namely the registrar from which you bought the domain, who it is that's going to provide your site with its IP address. And so specifically, what you need to tell your registrar, GoDaddy in this case, what the name of your website's name servers are. That is, whose DNS servers are going to be doing this translation of, I'm going to get an A.com to an IP address. And the name servers that all of us are going to be providing are specifically a server called ns1.cs75.net and ns for name server 2.cs75.net. 
In other words, we're about to tell GoDaddy that if you want to find I'm going to get an A.com or any other domain from a student in this class for that matter, go ask either of those two servers, which we, the staff, run, and those servers will answer that question for whoever it is that wants to visit your website. So, how do we do this? Well, let's go back to GoDaddy. Again, our discussion of DreamHost is concluded for now since we'll be using CS75.net henceforth. Uh, sort of Julia Child style, I actually did buy a domain name before class began so that everything would be configured properly. I'm going to go ahead and log in here with that account. Okay, and now I'm logged into the account. Uh, we have still here the same home page. I already own my domain, so I don't want to do another search. But as you'll see, Project Zero instructs you, you're going to go up to this brief menu and choose the very first option atop it, My Domains. And as the name suggests, what I'm about to see is the list of domain or domains that I own. Specifically, I opted to buy a little thing called MailinRouge.com. Um, I wish I could say I'm that clever, but a friend of mine actually thought of the domain. And frankly, it was so darn clever, I decided to get the .com, .net, and the .org, um, which sadly are being billed to me on a recurring annual basis, so it's a foolish decision. But let's go ahead and pick MailinRouge.com, which henceforth will take the place of our imaginary I'm going to get an A.com. And if any of you are clever, you'll snatch that domain up by lecture one next week. Here's this whole bunch of details now that I provided to GoDaddy when I registered for this domain name. So notice that they actually ask for things like an address. Um, this is your contact information. And do know that by default, this kind of stuff is public record. So you can go in what's called a who is database and generally find out who owns a domain name. If you want that private, you can pay a few dollars more and the registrar like GoDaddy will hide that information. I don't really care if you know where my office address is and frankly it's a lot cheaper to provide my office address than the additional $10 a year to keep it hidden. So there you have it. If you ever want to meet me during business hours and not at home, there is my address four different times. So what do we need to do on this screen? Well, we simply need to tell GoDaddy what my name servers are going to be. That is, what are the names of those computers on the internet that can tell the rest of the world what the IP address is of my website. And the only thing you're going to have to do for Project Zero with this first phase of building dynamic websites is change the name servers up there. Because by default, when you buy a domain at GoDaddy, it's not going to point to ns1cs75.net. I did that in advance to make sure everything would work for some demos tonight. But you will click that link up there, and it's going to refer to some parked name servers. GoDaddy by default puts a really big advertisement in your domain the very first day you buy it so that if anyone pulls it up until you move your site elsewhere, they just get a big old GoDaddy advertisement. So realize that that HTML is theirs. All you're going to have to do for Project Zero, as the PDF suggests, is fill in this value here for the first name server, this value here for the second. You're going to go ahead and click OK and done with GoDaddy, at least for the duration of the semester. So to summarize, we bought a domain name now called MailinRouge.com. We told GoDaddy what the names are of this domain's name servers. And now it's up to my web host, in this case CS75.net, to sort of do the rest and make sure that the world can actually find a website at that particular web host for me. Questions? Good question. So why this is a whole lot of something just to get us on the web. Why not just refer to my site by 1.2.3.4? What do you think? It's, you know, it's rarely that simple. Frankly, ours is actually like 65.130.147. something or other. And I just made that up to suggest how random it really is. But what else? So you can change the server more easily if you do have this layer of redirection. Moreover, there was the point I made earlier, which is that we can actually have multiple names referring to one address. So we can sort of get away with just one number, which are actually in finite supply. There's four billion of them possible, but a lot of people have uh, put their uh, uh, fingers into those numbers these days, so they're not as readily available as they were years ago. And a suggestion in back? Yep, no. Nope. Okay, sorry, I stole the answer. Yep. Also, DNS is multi-level. DNS is multi-level, so you have. Uh, do you want to elaborate? Different address for your mail versus www or different addresses for different 
Good. You get more flexibility when you have names too. So you don't have to just have one address that refers to everything. We, for the course, for instance, have cs75.net or www.cs75.net or mail.cs75.net, ns1.cs75.net. So we can sort of uniquely identify services by a way of names and not numbers. After all, this is why it's 1 800 collect and not 1 800 2 something something something. It's easier to remember for humans at the end of the day. Yeah? Um, I was just wondering about the host. Is it set up so that we can have uh, direct, can we work, can we work directly on the, on the server? Indeed. So we'll, we'll actually get to that, but you will have largely unfettered access to the server. So as much as you'd get from a typical host, plus more. Other questions? Yeah? Uh, where? The IP number where? Oh, I see. So if you had your own IP address at home, say from Comcast, and you wanted to host, say, your own website, you wouldn't put it here. You would actually, you could tell GoDaddy the specific IP address of your computer and avoid this layer of indirection here, but you would do that via a different interface. So let me actually defer that for now and focus just on this layer of indirection. Okay, good question. Why are there two? Anyone, just take a guess. What's reasonable? Case one's down, redundancy. Case one's down, right? And in fact, you can have a whole bunch of them, but it's just for redundancy's sake in case one of our servers go down. We're kind of cheating, which a lot of organizations do, because frankly, all of your sites are going to be hosted on one server. So if that server goes down, frankly, it doesn't matter if the first name server is still working. So we actually have everything running on the same server. So if you know how, these IP, the IP addresses of these names actually refer to the same machine. Our machine, for various reasons, has four different IP addresses, but they all map to the same box. But you, the users, really don't need to know that. Yeah? <laughs> my, my web address is resolved by this uh, name server. Ultimately, yes. So who resolves the name server idea? Ah, good question. So is we have sort of a chicken and the egg problem here. If I'm telling GoDaddy that to find out the address corresponding to this name, Here's another name, but I'm not telling GoDaddy how to go resolve that name. Hopefully, there is some kind of oracle that can answer that question. So there's actually even more of a hierarchy than I've depicted on the blackboard here. And one of the recommended readings on Project Zero actually fleshes this out in a bit more detail. It's on a great site called How Stuff Works. They actually walk through a slightly more complicated scenario. But for tonight's purposes, suffice it to say that there is more of a hierarchy. That is, there are other DNS servers in the world besides the one run by Comcast or Computer Science East 75, and specifically, there are at least 13 root servers, so to speak, uh, uh, sprinkled throughout the world on various continents that at the end of the day are responsible for telling anyone where other name servers can be found. For instance, the name server that knows who runs all of the .coms and who runs all of the .orgs. But let me defer to the, the um, suggested reading for more details. Any other questions before forging ahead? All right, so that's a typical scenario. Buy your domain name, set it up on a web host, but there are, there's perhaps a third typical option these days. The reason that those web hosting accounts through like DreamHost and ours, frankly, which is going to be free for you, granted there's little registration fee for the course, um, you can run your own server, either your own physical box, maybe in your own home via your Comcast connection, though I suspect that actually violates Comcast's agreements with you, or at least in your office if you have an IP address and you have a physical box, but increasingly popular these days for both, for both technological and financial reasons are what are called virtual private servers, which give the illusion that you have your own computer system, but you actually have a virtual machine, so to speak, running on one physical box, but other customers also have virtual machines running on that same physical box. So in other words, we have signed up as a course with a company called Servant, which provides virtual private servers for an account that gives us, with the, gives us the illusion that we have a server that has a dual two CPUs, each of which has four cores, if that means anything to you, upwards of 16 gigabytes of RAM with RAID 10 uh, SATA uh, drives connected, uh, zero downtime during failure, hot swap drives and fans, uh, dual gigabit Ethernet, in, uh, dual gigabit network interfaces, and then something related to the virtual machine itself. So we have the illusion, because we signed up with these guys, of having that machine. 
but so do a bunch of other customers. And only when all of us customers start using the machine too much do you actually get less potentially than you're paying for. But at that point, a well-managed virtual uh, host would actually move one of those virtual machines to another physical box. And that's sort of what we're paying for is a guaranteed, not 16 gigabytes, but rather we are guaranteed with our contract to get two gigabytes of RAM to use for the accounts on our system. So we say this because one, this is actually representative of an increasingly popular trend, that of running virtual machines. In fact, if any of you run Parallels on your Mac, or if any of you have run a virtual PC or VMware on your PCs or Linux boxes, those are virtual machines, software as well, and this is the same idea here. But you, the student, and you, the developer, can think of what we provide in the form of CS75.net is just a server. And frankly, had we never told you it was virtual, you probably never would have noticed unless you did a little sleuthing around. So what does this mean for us? Well, how do we now get our website up on CS75.net? Well, I, you have, as a customer have just paid me $5.95 for the first month of class and education here. So what I'm going to do is provide you with a username and a password with which you can connect to CS75.net. So let's take a look at what that's going to look like. And again, even though we run this server, we've d in configured it and installed certain software on it so that it really is representative of what you would get at a commercial third-party host. This course is not meant to teach you how to use, for instance, Harvard's FAS systems, but rather real-world web hosts. And so we're mimicking that for you, but keeping us all together on the same box so that we, the staff, can see the same things that you see much more easily. So I'm going to go to CS75.net, which is for now just the course's website. But thanks to this system called DNS, we can also go to panel.cs75.net, and that's actually going to look for now, until I spend some time making it look prettier, it's going to look like this. It's asking you for a username and password. Well, uh, at this point, I, the student, have submitted my part of my project zero. I follow the directions up to like the second or third page of it, which tells me to uh, fill out a form that the staff is going to read sometime this week. We're then going to see, oh, you bought, I'm going to get an A.com. Let's create an account for you on our system, and we're going to email to your current Gmail or whatever account a username and password to use for the duration of the semester. All right, I already received this email from myself, and I'm going to go ahead and log in as Malin here. Go ahead and log in. And now what I see here is actually a product called Direct Admin. This is perhaps the third most popular control panel, so to speak, that you find on popular web hosts these days. What a control panel is in this context is generally just a nice graphical user interface, GUI, that simplifies and makes so much more fun the process of managing a website. This is an alternative and a welcomed alternative to yesteryear when you really had to have many more units or Linux skills because everything we're going to start doing this semester you used to have to do with fairly arcane configuration files and commands. And we will emphasize and use Linux in this course, but not for stupid stuff like, like just creating an email account, which you'd like to do, get out of the way, and then move on to more interesting work. We're going to use this control panel, which the folks at Direct Admin, I should say, were generous enough to just donate to the course. Um, which is very simple. There are two other alternatives I'll mention, because those of you who might be hosting your own websites after this course might come across two panels called cPanel and another one called Plesk, which are perhaps the number one and two control panels. Frankly, I think cPanel in particular, which is the most popular out there by far, but also the most expensive, is one of the most confusing things I have ever seen. Frankly, I hate it. Um, and this isn't to uh, preach negatively about anything in the course, but I personally sort of esteem simplicity over most, all, most every other thing. Um, certainly when it comes to teaching something. So this product, Direct Admin, is, just a, is almost as featureful as these other control panels, but frankly, it just kind of looks fun to use, right? In just a few days, you'll have an account on this. And frankly, if you're not as excited as I am about using a control panel, maybe this isn't the course for you. But <laughs> once I have that username and password, this is what I'm going to have access to. Let's do a little sanity check. It looks like this is indeed an account that the staff set up for MalinRouge.com. Up here at the top right, you'll see how much disk space and bandwidth and email addresses we've allocated to you. As per Project Zero or the syllabus, you'll each get upwards of 500 megabytes on the server, unlimited bandwidth, as many email accounts as you want, as many MySQL databases as you need. 
and a whole bunch of other stuff. So let's actually take a look now, though, at uh, email accounts. Right? That's the first fun one. Right? If you plan on using this domain, if you've never owned a domain before, it's kind of cool to have a vanity domain out there. How, to go, how do I go about creating an email address? Well, again, we're going to leave a lot of this to your own exploration. And we're not going to bore you with th click this link and that during lectures, typically. But know that we'll create automatically one email address for you with the same username that we provide. But creating another email address for like your mother is as simple as clicking Create Email Account, mom at mailinrouge.com. I'll give her a random password. Uh, I'm going to say mom can only send 50 megabytes and receive 50 megabytes of emails. Create it. Done. Now I can go tell mom, presumably by phone, so that it's secure, what her new username, mom is, what her password is, and using some additional details in an email that was automatically generated just now to the owner of this account, you, will she, like me, be able to use webmail or pop and imap and SMTP with Outlook or Eudora or Max Mail Client, whatever. So this is truly a fully featured product that we'll be using in the course with which you can do anything you can imagine with a typical domain name. And frankly, it's generally as simple as that. But let's raise the bar a little bit. We spent a bit talking about DNS before. Let's push a little harder on that. There's this other link on the home page called DNS Management. And this now shows a bit more uh, esoteric information. And let's take a peek at this for just a moment. Those of you in back, can you kind of see what's printed here? OK, it's a little small, but I don't think I can really increase it on this particular site. But notice that we have a few different things here. So one, we have this line that says mailinrouge.com, period which denotes that it's not a host name, it's the full domain name. Notice that this is a, an A record, so to speak. And apparently, mailinrouge.com maps to 64.131.79.130. So that was the number I was trying to remember before. It's not 1.2.3.4. It's this address. But frankly, we're going to configure that for you. We have the ability technologically to move your, I, move your domain from IP address to IP address throughout the semester without you knowing, presumably, thanks to this system called DNS. So an A record, no for now, is what a DNS administrator would define if he or she wants to specify the IP address of a server. So what are we looking at here? Well, this is actually the configuration file for NS1 and NS2. So what I described as fairly arcane configuration files are, in fact, arcane uh, configuration files on our server. But products like this control panel make it a little more user friendly to interface with. But you still have to know what you're doing. And you still have to know what these things mean. What is another host name that apparently shares the same IP address as my domain name? Just inferring from this example here. Yeah, so some of you might have wondered, how is it that some websites have both CNN.com that work, but also www.cnn.com? Well, somewhere in CNN's name servers, they have an entry for both CNN.com, which, uh, CNN which is presumably an A record. And then uh, they probably have www with nothing after it, because it's just inferred that if there's nothing after the host name, that it's in the domain in question. So if you're specifying the domain, you add the dot in this interface. If you're specifying just the host name to which you want the rest appended, you don't specify the dot. But this is an A name as well. But it turns out there's another type of record. So an A name simply maps host names or domain names to IP addresses. But there's these things called C name or canonical name uh, records, which are like aliases. So another way to implement this, you should know, is that if I don't want to manually type in again and again and again that all of these different host names, www, SMTP, mail, IMAP, all map to the same IP address? Because if, as I said, I want to move this website to another IP address, I've just created a lot of work for me. I've got to change five or so, it seems, different entries. Much simpler, I think, would be if I could simply get rid of this entry for www. Now it's gone, and create a new one, which via this interface amounts to just putting in the host name here and then telling it what to point to. So I'm creating a C name record for www that points to not an IP address, but a domain name. So as you can kind of guess perhaps here, what this now means is that www is just an alias, a C name for mailinrouge.com. So if I now want to move my website to a completely different web host, for instance, or at least just a different IP address within my own little private network here, what record do I have to change? 
in just the A record for MoulinRouge.com. So there's a downside potentially, which is that performance-wise, now if someone on the internet wants to look up www.mailinrouge.com, their computer is going to ask the, wor the, the local DNS server, what's the IP address for www.mailinrouge.com? But the answer could come back as, well, it's the same as for mailinrouge.com. Go figure that one out. So potentially there's multiple lookups now, so it's potentially a trade-off for how many DNS lookups you want your computer or your server to be doing versus how easy you want the thing to be maintained. But the takeaway for tonight is just what the options are. Because DNS otherwise might look kind of scary, at least on first glance, but those are perhaps the two most common records. There are other records as well. And actually, let's show you kind of a neat trick here. So using this aliasing, you don't have to refer, in fact, to a machine uh, host name that you own. So suppose I want to do... Um, uh, Something called, I implemented this really fancy search engine recently. Or no, really fancy news site. It's called supernews.mailinrouge.com. Well, I'm going to add a CNAME entry for supernews, mailinrouge.com. And now I'm actually going to pull up a uh, Linux command line here just so I can demonstrate something. Uh, let's do uh, mailin. Log in here. So this is the same server you'll soon have access on. I'm going to run a program called NSLOOKUP for name server lookup. And I want to look up, first as an example, mailinrouge.com. So look up the IP address. So this is like a manual tool, a nice administrator's tool for just checking IP addresses and host names, just like Mac OS or Windows are going to do automatically for you. But now let's try this, uh, www.mailinrouge.com also refers to, resolves to the same address. But notice there's this mention here, hey, wait a minute, there's a CNAME record pointing to that, whose address in turn is this. So NSLOOKUP tells us that. Now let's try this thing called uh, supernews.mailinrouge.com. OK, interesting. Supernews.mailinrouge.com. Whoa, did I do this wrong? Oh, I completely goofed here. Delete that. That's going to make for a stupid demo. <laughs> Supernews is going to resolve not to mailinrouge.com, but cnn.com. Now the demo will make more sense. OK, so now it, supernews.mailinrouge.com should resolve to cnn.com if uh, the server goes and reloads its configuration. So here is mailinrouge. Uh, let's just do supernews.mailinrouge.com. Enter. OK, Apache is functioning normally, <laughs> unfortunately. Oh, damn. Let's see, I did it too soon before the server reloaded itself. Uh, IP config, fly. <coughs> supernews.mailinrouge.com. Damn. OK. <laughs> I messed up. The, well, let's try once more. Once more. We'll, we'll try another one. Uh, supernews2. Why did you put a period after the dot com? It is just a feature of direct admin where to specify that this is not a local host name, but rather a full domain name. You put the dot on the end as a terminus to indicate as much. All right, let's try this one last time before putting my tail between my legs and moving on to a different demo. All right, so let's go to supernews2.mailinrouge.com. Yeah, how about, can I fake it? Okay, and magically, here we go. <laughs> okay, I actually tested that earlier tonight, but it seems the server didn't reload its config as fast, so maybe I just timed it right before. So believe me, that should have worked, um, as you saw with CNN's news coming up in the end there. But the point for now is just this is how you can create these associations between domain names and IP addresses, but also those more, um, those things called subdomains or host names, and as well, IP addresses or other names. Yes? Oh, good question. Let's try uh, Super News now. Oh, see? Believe me now? Now it's working. OK, supernews.mailinrouge.com. This is on this Linux box, but IE or Windows has possibly cached this. But let's try one last time. Yeah, my Windows has cached it. Those of you with laptops, though, if you want to try supernews.mailinrouge.com, or hopefully seeing CNN at this point, since flushing the DNS cache as I tried there was not enough for Windows, apparently. Anyhow. Try it at home. It should work then. All right. So what then 
to summarize, so what was the point of all of that? So if you're going to be running your own website and administering it yourself with some degree of technical savvy, knowing these kinds of details will allow you to do things like, hey, we want our website to be at both I'm going to get an A.com and www.I'm going to get an A.com. How do we make this work? Well, the answer quite fairly simply is via DNS with these A records or these C name records. And we'll actually see probably next week or maybe even tonight if you want to force users just for your own nitpicky reasons to be able to type either but you always want the address to become www.yourdomain.com, there are little tricks that you can do with the web server. One of the most popular is called Apache, which is what we'll be using in the course on a Linux system. Little tricks that you can configure your website with so that the user can visit either. But just for marketing reasons or whatever, it will always become just www.mydomain.com. In fact, we do that with cs75.net. If you pull up cs75.net, you do, in fact, get this particular website that we glanced at a moment ago, but if you also pull up www.cs75.net, you will also get that same website and notice no www. We ripped it out of the URL automatically just because it looks a little cleaner to have it that way. You can do it either way. Yeah. Okay. Really good question. So how is it that whereas I just wanted to fake CNN's site and have everyone map, have those two addresses, Super News and Super News 2 and CNN.com mapped to the same site, we obviously don't want to do that. We don't want you all working on the same website, albeit accessible via different addresses. So thanks to what's called virtual hosting, which is distinct from a virtual private server. Virtual hosting is the, the technology, the ability of web servers today to host multiple websites on one IP address. And the reason for this, as we'll see, is that when you request a web page of, say, CNN.com, even though your computer, as before, has to ask the world, what's the IP address of CNN.com so that it can go contact that same server with a subsequent request, included in its request for the day's news is a mention of what the URL is that the user typed in. What domain name did the user provide? So that upon receipt of that request, a web server who has, is at that IP address can say, OK, this person wants index.html, the default name of most web pages, but they want index.html for uh, I'm going to get an a.com. And so the server will recognize that piece, of, that hint that's included automatically in the browser's request and show the user that HTML file as opposed to another student's. So what this control panel, Direct Admin, is really doing for us when we create multiple accounts is creating this illusion that, this, uh, that all of these different domain names are actually hosted on the same server, but they will point to different accounts, sort of unbeknownst to the rest of the world. Other questions? All right, so you'll see or perhaps hear of other types of DNS entries. MX happens to refer to mail. So if you ever want to set up mail on a web server, which you presumably would, or at least my mom would now that she has an account, your server has to have what's called an MX entry, which is just a similar row in that table, but it specifies the name or IP address of the server that processes mail for the domain. Since it's a nice thing to be able to separate web from mail from other services. So MX records allow the world to ask not for where the web page is for CNN, but where is their mail server so that I can actually send mail to say Ted Turner or someone else at CNN. But all of that is configured for you automatically. And those A name records and C name records are also configured for you as students automatically. You're welcome to delete those things and change them around. But as we suggest in Project Zero, don't do that just yet, since we'd rather not begin the semester by fixing the semester. Uh, NS as well refers to settings that we had to do to get the name servers themselves working. So just realize that those are in there as well. So uh, uh, Wikipedia is wonderfully useful for some things, particularly um, uh, looking for diagrams of processes that other people have spent the time making really nice images of. So this is a depiction that we did pull from Wikipedia that sort of describes a typical sequence of steps that happen when a computer requests resolution of a domain name or host name. But if you want even more detail than that simple picture suggests, again, Project Zero's recommended reading has a whole write-up of a sample process. Yeah. Control panel, 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. So what these control panels like Direct Admin and Plesk and cPanel do, all they do is put a prettier front end on the same types of configuration files that have been in use for five, ten years on a lot of these systems. Exactly. Apache, uh, a bind for the name server, um, XIM and Dove, uh, Dovecot in the case of mail. So all of those configuration files, same processes running, just a different GUI for configuring them. That's all it is. Other questions? No? All right, so we now have our domain name. We now have a web host. I now have an email address. I'm not going to spend time for tonight's purposes on how you check your email. In fact, know that there's just a link on the panel that says webmail. You can presumably figure the email part out from there. But now I actually want to put a website out on the web. So before we take a break here, let's see how we're going to do this. So how many of you in the room have used FTP or SFTP before? OK, fantastic. So most of you. So for those of you who haven't used something like FTP or SFTP, Secure File Transfer Protocol, know also that one of the nice, useful things that a panel like this provides is a little icon in this case called Files. So if I want to start uploading files to my web hosted account, uh, know for now, and we'll spend uh, much more time on this over the course of the semester, public underscore HTML is the directory into which all of your web content this semester should be going. So if you don't like those tools like SFTP and the like, you can do it all via the web. If I want to upload a file to this directory on mailinrouge.com, I can specify the files. It's not the cleanest interface. I have to do one file, another file, another file. But if this scares you less than some other tools, by all means use it. So let's do just this. I, again, Julia Child style, uh, whipped up a file called index.html, which contains some of that uh, XHTML stuff we alluded to earlier. I'm going to upload that from my desktop to mailinrouge.com. I used my Photoshop skills to make an image called mailinrouge.jpg. I'm going to go ahead and upload that as well. I'm going to click Upload Files. That was pretty darn fast on Harvard's connection here. Let's go back to my files interface. Notice now I have index.html, mailinrouge.jpg. Um, those of you who aren't familiar with Linux file permissions know, as Project Zero Spec says, that when you have to configure permission, it should be done automatically for you. Websites require that their files be viewable by the world, that is, world readable. And the arcane numbers you'll use for that are 644 for files, 711 for directories usually. But we don't need to dwell on such details for now. All of that was done automatically for me, which seems to suggest that I can go to mailinrouge.com, hit enter. Uh, my laptop's going to contact uh, Harvard's name server and say, give me the IP address of mailinrouge.com. If Harvard's name server doesn't know, he's going to contact probably one of those root servers or maybe Harvard's ISP server, depending on how things are configured. At the end of the day, that number 64.whatever is going to be returned to my laptop. Internet Explorer is going to say, give me the default home page at this address, at that IP address, for the domain mailinrouge.com. And if all went according to plan, demo two of two here should give us mailinrouge. <laughs> let's, let's take a five minute break. We are back. Just a quick show of hands, if I may. Um, SSH, how many of you have SSH to a system before? OK, so most of you. Um, I'll do a quick demo here, but know that, as promised before, you'll be able to interface with your domains in any number of ways, not only to uploading files via that GUI I just showed, but many of you will feel most comfortable, perhaps, at a command line. So with this username and password that you're getting on cs75.net, with which to manage and use your domains, you'll also be able to SSH, so to speak. So long story short, SSH is a protocol or in practice a program that allows you from say your laptop or desktop at home or at work to connect to another system remotely and control it by executing commands, albeit within the confines of a text-based screen. So if you have a Macintosh, you'll ultimately be using a program in like your utilities folder called Terminal. If you're on a PC, you can use a popular program called Putty. Uh, we as the course will provide you with secure CRT, which is commercial software that Harvard has site licensed. So that's what you'll see in a lot of our examples. But just to give you a taste of this, if I wanted to actually not just upload files, but actually poke around within my cs75.net account. What I would actually do is load this program called Secure CRT, for instance, on a PC. 
I'm going to go up to the connect window and we'll soon have a handout on the course's website under resources that walks you through these steps if unfamiliar. I'm going to connect to something I pre-configured in advance for lecture for CS75.net. However, once you have your domain pointing to our servers, you'll also be able to type in I'm, uh, I'm going to get an A.com and because it has the same IP address as CS75.net, they're really equivalent. So you can SSH to either. You don't need to SSH constantly to CS75. I'm going to log in as Malin with the password I was emailed by myself. And now you see this thing. It's just a big black window with white text and a blinking prompt at which I can type commands. Not that, but real commands. Uh, a popular command in this Linux environment is LS, which will list commands. Uh, you'll notice that there's that directory I promised is called public HTML. CD is change directory. I can change into that directory. And if I now type ls, just a quick quiz, what am I going to see? Good, those two files that I uploaded, index.html and mailinrouge.com. Um, JPEG. So you can use a bunch of programs. Vim is a popular one. Emacs is another one. Pico, Nano. If you've never used any of these tools before, that's fine. And the course's sections and office hours, which I'll talk about in just a bit, will provide you with some hands-on instruction with this. But know now, as we'll come back to tonight, you can also just use Notepad on your PC or text edit on your Mac and make your web pages that way. It's not perhaps the best environment, but if you're just looking to sort of take baby steps for now, that's totally fine. So I'm going to use a little program called VI here just to show you what was inside index.html. And for now, know that this will be our first web page tonight. We're going to try to level the playing field in just a bit, teach you all how to make web pages, not dynamic web pages, but web pages so that next week with PHP, we can hit the ground running and start making uh, real dynamic web pages. This is one of the simplest pages you might make in a language called XHTML, which we'll come to in just a little bit. Before then, uh, what have you gotten yourselves into? So the prereqs for this course are generous, to say the least, because it is very much meant to be accessible to a different ra uh, wide range of students. And I suspect it's quite likely, and I won't put you on the spot with a show of hands, that we probably have students both uncomfortable with this stuff and more comfortable with this stuff. That is, some of you who have taken computer science E1, perhaps, uh, another introductory course here or elsewhere. Maybe you have a little bit of programming experience, whether it's way back when with Fortran or uh, BASIC, or more recently with Java or C. And some of you, frankly, are probably developers, if not full-time web designers, and you're just looking to sort of take things up a notch and learn a bit more. And the course is meant to accommodate the range of students. So just realize that in lectures, Probably I'll go too fast for some of you sometimes, and sometimes I'll go too slow for others of you. But we'll try to walk that fine line of making none of you happy most of the time. <laughs> but at least, at least you'll all get a little something out of it from different angles. So we'll try to, if you're walking out of here a little bit confused every night because a little bit was over your head, that's probably a good place to be in. Otherwise, it would sort of call into question why you're here. Yeah? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's okay. Okay. It results an IP address which is equivalent to NSLOOKUP. Okay. That address, right? So if I put that IP address directly in the web browser, I hit enter. Oh, good question. Uh, so let me summarize. So if I don't type in my domain name, but instead I type my domain name's IP address, what's going to happen? Well, let me do NSLOOKUP on mailinrouge.com again. All right, so here's the IP address, which I'm going to copy. And now I'm going to go to my browser. And I'm not going to type mailinrouge.com, but rather HTTP colon slash slash and that number, enter. This is what we saw earlier, actually. So there's a default website on the course's server, which turns out not very interesting. But it's there because the web server is looking really at the URL or the, the HTTP request that was sent for what the host name is. And in the absence of a host name, it's serving up this generic page. Now, by contrast, consider a much more reputable site than CS75.net like CNN.com. Turns out they have a bunch of IP addresses. Let me copy the first one and see if that same trick works there and we just get some generic web page. Well, it turns out CNN's pretty serious about their web serving and they don't have little moms and pop shops on their own web servers in addition to the day's news. They own that IP address and host everything, not virtually, but in real terms at that address. So for CNN, you actually get to the website. In our case, and in the case of many websites today, that won't work. Is it possible to assign virtual IP addresses for a machine which hosts multiple domains? Is it so yes, a machine can certainly host multiple domains, because that's what we're doing. Yes, but can, you, can it assign public virtual IP addresses? If I, if I 
No. So, well, not really. So let me actually suggest fielding that question afterward, but short answer, no. If you have fake internal IP addresses, the rest of the world won't be able to access those. But you can use that, say, in your home, behind your cable modem, or your home router if you want to share IP addresses there. But I can elaborate more technically afterward. So what are the prerequisites? So we as a course want to and need to be able to assume that if we say, go write a loop, go write a condition, go write a function, that you generally know what we mean. And we don't have to start at that level. So having taken computer science E50A here, I think, is fine. Um, Having done even a little bit of JavaScript programming or Java or C, any fairly modern um, procedural programming language, even just a semester's worth, probably is sufficient for the course's purposes, um, even though we're not focusing on programming today, but rather on these fundamentals and soon on XHTML and CSS, the course will ultimately be very much about programming. So I suspect for those less comfortable students, you might end up spending, frankly, more time on the course, but I suspect the marginal return for you will be even higher because you'll simply pick up more as you go. I think with project one, not to be confused with tonight's project zero, you'll get a, t a better taste of what's going to be expected in the projects. But it's meant to be accessible for students just coming out of, say, an introductory programming course. But those of you who are going to go to work tomorrow and code up something full in Java or the like probably will find the course to be at least doable in less time, but presumably you would take the ball and run with it in a different direction and maybe push yourself a little harder with some of the cooler, uh, fancier things we'll be getting into in the course like Ajax and the like. Question in the back? Good question. Uh, no programming experience at all. I would say if your personality is of the right type, absolutely. You can pick this stuff up. There's no reason why one can't teach him or herself a language like PHP. It's fairly uh, user friendly, to put it nicely, uh, unlike something like C or something that's lower level. So I would say, sure, give it a shot. And I think you'll know in a couple of weeks if you're willing to commit for a couple as to just how, uh, how well it would work for you. Expectations. Attend or watch all of the lectures, which are here being recorded. If you can't make it or do not wish to make it to campus someday, implement four assigned projects, the first one of which, everything, if you haven't noticed, is zero indexed in this course. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, it was, went out tonight. Uh, and design and implement a final project, which is meant to be the culmination of the course. More on those in just a moment. So where are we going in terms of content in the course's lectures? Well, it's in lectures where we'll try to introduce um, it, most, uh, where we'll emphasize concepts. I think it's incredibly boring, for instance, to introduce you to every one of the functions available to you in PHP. So rather, we'll teach you some of the basics, the syntax, uh, give you a sense of what the language can do, and then help teach you to help you help yourself by turning to the wonderful resource that is PHP.net, the user's manual, so to speak, for PHP Online. It's sort of the uh, Java doc of the PHP world, if you're familiar. It's wonderful, and PHP is a wonderful language for uh, noobs, so to speak, because you can really teach yourself by way of online examples, online resources, far more so than several other languages. So tonight is about those topics there. Uh, the following two weeks, we'll dive right into PHP. So with project one and those lectures, you'll already be making dynamic websites. What do I mean, by the way, by dynamic? Well, websites that presumably change depending on the user that visits them, change depending on the time of day, change depending on what you have in stock in your warehouse, and that sort of thing. SQL will be in lectures three and four. Uh, this is the query language with which one can retrieve and store data in a database. JavaScript, of course, is something you're probably familiar with, at least by name. It's not Java. So no, if you take nothing away tonight, Java is not the same thing as JavaScript. They simply uh, borrowed the, the naming scheme there. We'll focus in lecture six and seven on AJAX, which is actually just a buzzword for asynchronous JavaScript and XML. And frankly, it doesn't often use XML anymore, so now it's just sort of lowercase AJAX as opposed to an acronym AJAX. But how many of you here, just to ask a uh, easy question, have used Google Maps before? Okay, you've all used Ajax. So Google Maps, and when it came out a few years ago, was one of the sexiest map tools around because its user interface was just so much better to this day than MapQuest and Yahoo and a few other sites out there. If we go to maps.google.com, I don't have to tell you how this site works um, interface-wise, but let me go ahead and pick uh, one Oxford Street in 02138, which is where we are now. The fact that I can click and drag, and if you watch closely, what do you see happening at the left of the page, ever so briefly? 
Yeah, so those images aren't in my browser's cache until Google realizes, oh, I need those images and therefore fetches them. Well, the technology, so to speak, the buzzword that enables websites to retrieve yet more data and integrate it into the existing web page without clearing the whole slate and then presenting the user with another page is called AJAX, asynchronous JavaScript and XML. And what it really amounts to is the web page, once it's already loaded, making yet more requests of a web server, getting back a response behind the scenes and then embedding it somehow usually into the actual web page. And in fact, what's really nice about not Ajax per se, but a lot of the tools that now exist are that you can integrate lots of publicly available tools and data sets into your own software. So what we'll likely spend some time on later in the semester as well in the same context is this, this other buzzword, which is actually a lot of fun, silly though the buzzword is, or overused. Anyone heard of a mashup before? So mashup is just the cool way of saying taking something that someone else wrote and taking something that someone else wrote and combining them and saying you wrote it now. So um, I did just that. So <laughs> just to give you a sense and to pat myself on the back here, a little project I actually did when I was a student was write this program that shows you the Harvard shuttle schedule. So if I want to go from Mather House to Boylston Gate, which is in Harvard Yard, here is, a, it's actually intentionally ugly because it was originally a Linux program, lest you think that this is the guy teaching you now how to make websites. Um, this was designed to mimic the Unix interface. But the sexy thing we added to the site recently was GPS. So all the shuttle buses now have a GPS transponder in them that uploads some data, that makes available via the web some data. So here's Google Map. And to prove it, look at how I can click and drag all around Cambridge. But these red dots actually move around as the shuttle buses move. Now, they're not perfect yet, because the data I'm able to pull off the shuttles currently is not, um, it doesn't map perfectly onto Google Maps, because they have their own SVG-based map. So the red dots don't move cleanly. They hop from stop to, uh, stop, to stop. Um, that's just my disclaimer, that this isn't as good as it hopefully will be by the time I finish taking this class. Um, but this is a mashup in the sense that I have some data of mine, the shuttle data, and I don't have my own map, so I'm using Google Maps. So using their JavaScript API, freely available, for which I signed up for an account, I'm able to mash these things together and create useful, arguably, software. So we'll try to spend some time on that later in the semester in that context of Ajax. And Google is wonderful in that they just have so many different options like this, search and maps and a whole bunch of others. Uh, the calendar as well can be mashed up as well these days. So we'll see if we can point you in some fun directions, especially for your final projects. We'll talk about security, issues of scalability, and then also issues of cross-platform ness for lack of a better word. So to this day, one of the most annoying, if not fun parts of website development is getting the damn things to work, not just on your computer, but other people's computers. And sad to say, not everybody uses Internet Explorer or Firefox or Safari. But if you're the designer of websites and you actually care about your user's experience, guess what? You're going to start using Internet Explorer, Safari, and Firefox, maybe even Opera, and any number of other browsers. So one of the emphases we'll have in this class is not just on integrating and applying the course's ideas, but really, dare say, doing it perfectly. And what we're going to be looking for really is correctness. And we're going to test your websites not just with our own favorite browser, but I'm actually going to pull up Safari on my PC or on my Mac to look at your websites, as will the teaching fellows. We'll pull up Firefox and Internet Explorer. For Project Zero, what you'll see is that we're not being completely insane, but we do require that your websites, simple though they will be for this first project, look and behave the same on at least two different browsers. Because frankly, it's a very real world expectation these days. And you really will only appreciate how annoying this cross-platform, uh, cross-browser development can be until you realize how many damn inconsistencies there are in these different implementations of web browsers, simple in concept though they may be. A couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, so SQL is just a language. So it's, a, it's the syntax with which you can query a database. We'll be using in the course MySQL, which is an implementation of SQL. It is a very popular and freely available database, at least in one form, that we'll be using. Um, and it's, it drives some of the most popular websites today for both its performance reasons and also the fact that it's free, unlike something like Oracle or the like. So different uses, but it's uh, a de facto standard, certainly, behind a lot of websites today. And uh, in fact, I think we're giving you almost unlimited databases, or at least the six you'll need for the course. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering for your mashup, how frequently does your AJAX query 
Oh, good question. Every two seconds currently. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But yes, uh, my AJAX queries are being executed every two seconds against the Harvard shuttle site. They haven't noticed yet. <laughs> yeah. Would we able to integrate uh, other programs into our web browsers, things like uh, the Divix Web Player or Sure. So good question. Can you uh, integrate other plugins and the like to your website's Flash? Presumably, yes, that should be fine. I would, uh, and if you're going beyond the scope of, say, the project specs, I would ping us in advance, the teaching staff, just so we know what we'd expect, because we probably don't want to start ourselves installing this thing and that on our own computers to test things. But I think, you know, if you compelling reasons and you think it'd be fun to learn something new, by all means, that should be fine. The point here really is to encourage creativity and application of this stuff and not just have you all making the same website. So you'll find that each of the projects uh, encourages and allows for a great deal of um, creativity, since I think that's a lot more fun than all of us making a shuttle site for a project. Uh, finally, in lecture 12, meant to be the culmination of the class, for those of you who are physically proximal to Cambridge, we'll have not a science fair, but a computer science fair where we order some, in some food, get a maybe more sociable room than this one, and uh, check out each other's projects on a bunch of different computer screens. So it should be a nice clim uh, climax to the course. So sections. Let me draw attention to three of our teaching staff members here tonight. You'll meet them in due time, Cato, Chris, and Dan, if you want to maybe just give a wave here. Uh, Chris is uh, part, and Chris, our videographer as well. Uh, we have two Dans and two Chris's working us, with us this semester, so that's already half of the names out of the way. Um, but the teaching fellows of the course will be providing, in a, to supplement lectures each week, these things called sections, with which many of you are probably familiar. Don't write down this time, because I think it's now out of date, because this room's been taken away from us, I believe. So I'm going to go with the dot, 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 and say we'll announce via the course's website, or more likely email, as soon as we know this week when sections will be offered. We're going to offer a few different times during the week, and sections to be led by the teaching fellows are meant to be a more intimate environment than this with just a few of your classmates present in which you'll be able to ask questions about the current project, things that I said that came out of my mouth rather confusingly, um, and other such topics. It's meant to be an opportunity to review material and also get guidance on the current week's project. For those of you who can't attend some week or are physically remote, um, one of those sections will be filmed for all uh, to access on the web in addition to these lectures. So for now, um, there's no officially announced section just yet. We'll likely do that by email as soon as we get the rooms from the powers that be. So what are the projects going to involve? Well, the first one, Project Zero, is really just about these basics. It's going to have you uh, buy your own domain name for about $9.99, although GoDaddy, I think, is having a sale on like the .mobi domain, if you'd like one of those, for $2.99. Um, and you'll focus just on some of the basics so that, again, we level the playing field with this first project. The second project, we're going to make, start making things dynamic and integrate not only web pages via XHTML, but also PHP, a language in which many popular websites today are written. Project two, we're going to take things up a notch as well, and we're actually going to have a database driving your website. So it's going to be dynamic, but also having the ability to store and retrieve data, particularly in theory for many users. And we'll also integrate a bit of JavaScript. So if you've ever wondered how you can validate form fields and check and make sure the user's done something legitimate in the page or do any number of other things, we'll do a bit of JavaScript there. And then in the final assigned projects, project three, we'll tack on to that AJAX so that you have some super fanciness behind the scenes that's actually giving your user interface an even more seamless appearance. And be gone will be those full entire page reloads. You'll actually be doing some more things in the background. Maybe not quite of the flavor of Google Maps, but if you've ever started typing words into a web page, uh, those of you who use Facebook, and it starts guessing who your friends are based on the first few letters you're typing, that's a sort of AJAX call. Or just think of it as auto-completion can be achieved achieved within web pages using AJAX these days. And then finally, the climax of the course from a project's perspective is meant to be the final project, whereby you can pretty much implement most anything you want that's consistent with the spirit and the content of the course. There'll be a proposal process and the like that's somewhat documented for now in the course's syllabus, and we'll have a spec for that in a month or two's time once you have a better sense of what you can yourself 
technically do for the final project. But um, it's fine if you do or don't choose your domain name now with an eye toward the uh, wonderful new business idea you're going to be implementing for your final project. Um, or it's fine if you have no idea yet what you're going to be doing. Just think of that as the, the end game for the course. Books. So there's no required books for this course because frankly probably the best resources are online and sitting next to you in terms of questions. Um, Books, though, that we recommend are these four. The ISBNs and the like are in the syllabus. Uh, they might be at the Harvard Coop, but I suspect you'll pay much, much more at the Harvard Coop. So I would check out Amazon for about a quarter of the price. Um, all of these are meant to... So this was sort of me sitting in Borders and Barnes & Noble one afternoon and looking through the whole damn offerings of PHP and HTML books, many of which are way too long for what they're supposed to be about. Um, these, I think, are pretty good. Um, so use them, think of them as references. They are on reserve in Grossman Library, the Extension School's uh, library. More on that in the syllabus. Um, but the course is meant to be independent of a textbook as well. So if you're a book person, you might want to check out these or any other. But almost on all of the projects, will I give you some suggestions of URLs or pages to check out uh, if you'd like some uh, more supplements than, say, we offer verbally in lectures or sections. So a lot of this course will, by nature, probably be about debugging. Uh, if you haven't programmed in a while, odds are you don't program perfectly. And if you have programmed uh, recently, uh, you've probably had some bugs recently too. It's sort of the nature of the beast. So this picture makes, uh, makes going to office hours look so fun and blissful, right? You, you only go when you're happy. But this is the computer lab at 53 Church Street, and it's where we'll likely be holding weekly office hours, whereby the TFs or I um, provide really one-on-one -on -one assistance. You can come in, work on your projects, and just kind of hope that we're still there when you do finally hit that bug, or come with your bug in mind or your questions in mind, and we'll lend a hand there. So we'll po post a schedule on the website before long using Ajax so that it automatically updates itself every minute so that you always know when the next possible office hours are. Um, and more on that uh, in the days to come, probably via email or the course's website. You'll note one of the handouts tonight is called how to attend virtual office hours. So we are also using, thanks to a Harvard site license, a product called Illuminate, which in a nutshell is a glorified chat room that you can log into via the course's website. Uh, when you log into this room, you will see yourself and perhaps a teaching fellow or two and perhaps other students listed in the usernames that are logged in. Uh, you'll be able to chat with the staff and or even other students in here. Um, th but uh, the magic of this software is that we, the staff, can sh view your own screen and even take control of your computer with you watching. Sort of think of this as academic tech support. So it's a wonderful tool, especially for those of you who we will never meet thanks to um, the distance between us. Um, this is a, will allow us not only to help those such students, but those of you who prefer to get help while watching Conan O'Brien late at night and might want to log in late at night if one of us is still up. This will um, detach you from the physical tether of, say, the computer lab and allow you to get help online. We've used this in a couple classes of mine thus far um, to some great success. So I think it's pretty much self-selecting. If you like getting help this way, by all means, log in when the schedule is posted. If you're not such a computer person and you're wondering why you're even here and you prefer a place that looks like this, then that will be available to you as well. So the course's website, uh, hopefully this kind of thing is self-explanatory since you're presumably beyond the point of using websites and now at the point of wanting to make websites, but know that this really will be your window to the class beyond the physical classes themselves. There will soon be a bulletin board there for Q&A. Uh, lectures and handouts and videos will all be linked there as well. The current schedule of office hours, the projects PDFs will be there, recommended resources and the section schedule, software available to you, contact information, and the course's syllabus. And as time passes, presumably more information as well. So just do look there for any information that you might be interested in. And of course, you've seen panel.cs75.net already. So that is the overview of the course. In a nutshell, we still have how to make web pages in front of ahead of us here. So, any questions about what you may or may not be coming back for next week? Yeah. So, good question. If you already have a domain name, do you need a new one? It is certainly simplest from our perspective to just get a new one and then follow the specs verbatim. 
Um, however, this class is about teaching you real world skills, so if you don't want to go that route, that's fine, but you will likely have to maintain the DNS records yourself and figure out how to do that with your particular host or registrar or the like, which is fine. I'm sorry? You can certainly change hosts if you want. Um, we leave it to you to decide. We sort of expect that everyone's going to be in a uniform environment, but if you have the comfort and the savvy to figure out how to make it happen elsewhere, then that's fine too, so long as the work is ultimately submitted on our servers and works on our servers. Yeah? Can we just have a subdomain? Can you just have a subdomain? That's uh, probably fine. In fact, future specs will uh, likely ask that students create like a Project one dot I'm going to get an A dot com subdomain and project two dot the same. Um, so if you can mimic that same idea with your own host, um, that's fine. Again, so long as the files ultimately do work and get submitted on our servers. That's. You can't because you still control DN You can't very seamlessly because you still control DNS even if you're pointing a subdomain to us. So we couldn't do all of the DNS magic for you here. You could host a subdomain with us, but you wouldn't have the subdomain ability unless you manually did it on your end, which is in theory fine, but it's again going to involve maybe just more of a nuisance um, on a per student basis, but it's up to you. We can advise over email if you'd like. Other questions? Yeah. For any initial correspondence, like this week, we will use just the default emails with which students registered, and we'll also post a link probably right on the course's homepage with the announcements. But we will soon migrate to some sort of list where we allow you to opt in with your preferred address. In fact, part of Project Zero is a form that you'll all fill out online that will ask you for your current preferred email address so that we have something even more recent than you registered with. Yeah. Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, let me take the fifth on that because I haven't thought through the ramifications. Um, so ask that again if you could, either by email or just in person sometime. Other questions? All right, so we know how to buy a domain. We know how to host a website. We know how to upload prefabbed files to a website. How do we create, how do we fill our site with XHTML. Well, let me first note that I keep using this term XHTML, which is distinct from the acronym you've probably heard more often, which is HTML. So HTML and XHTML are the languages with which web pages are written. And I gave you a teaser of that a moment ago. Specifically, when you write a web page by hand, it looks a little something like this. This is that very simple Malon Rouge website that I pulled up a moment ago. But I said this is an example of XHTML for the following reason. So HTML and XHTML are this this mark are literally, per their acronyms, markup languages. They're not programming languages. So if you know came into this course knowing HTML and XHTML, that doesn't count as prior programming experience. That counts as prior markup experience. Um, because what XHTML and HTML are largely about is about marking up data. You have some information, like your home page, uh, maybe some images that you want to present to the world, but at the end of the day, it's largely aesthetic. It's about the display of information, the presentation of information. And it does this by way of these blue things called tags. So the way that you make something bold in this world of web pages is typically to do something like open bracket B, which says make the following bold. I am bold, and then you tell the browser, stop making this bold by having what's called an end tag or a close tag, which is symmetrically just the same thing as the name, but with a forward slash in front of it. So that is the basic building block of any web page. Well, let's fast forward to a more interesting web page, and you have a whole bunch of stuff put together here. So how do we make our, a simple first XHTML page? Well, XHTML is equivalent in spirit to HTML, but it's a little more nitpicky when it comes to rules and syntax. For instance, those of you who are familiar with HTML know that you can put a line break, move your text from here to here, just by writing something like br close brackets. Well, that doesn't fly in XHTML. In XHTML, any tag that you open in that fashion, you must also close. So in the world of XHTML, you need to actually write a line break with open bracket, close bracket. Now, that looks kind of stupid, right? If I just want to do something, it seems like I have to start doing something and stop doing something. It'd be nice if I could do this all in the same breath, and you can 
for any HTML or XHTML tag or element more properly that really doesn't have a notion of open and close, you can actually use what are called empty elements where you put that forward slash inside of the same tag. So we're getting a little ahead of ourselves because really the story begins with this. If you want to make a web page and it's going to be written in this language called XHTML, which we will require usage of uh, for largely compliance reasons and compatibility reasons across browsers this semester, you need to copy and paste something that looks a little like that which after all these years I have yet to memorize, so I always copy and paste it from the most recently uh, made website. Uh, this I copied from our own course's website. So every different course just gets the same header. Um, but it is important that you get it correctly. The white space, the line breaks, those don't really matter here, but the actual content of this doc type declaration, as it's called, it does matter. And it informs the browser, hey, you are about to receive a page that is written not in HTML and not in XHTML uh, 2.0, but in XHTML 1.0. So if you're familiar with this notion, it's fine if you use strict or transitional or um, really those are the two that would relate here. We tend to use transitional because it allows for, uh, it's a little looser when it comes to rules. Well, once you have that copied and pasted from, uh, say, my first web page and soon yours, you tell the browser, hey, browser, here comes a web page. And you do that by doing open bracket HTML which is somewhat of a paradox because we're writing in XHTML, but they didn't bother to update the name of the tags when they created this language. So that's what we're stuck with. You need to do another copy paste here of this specific uh, attribute as it is called. So an attribute in XHTML is something that's inside of the tag that somehow modifies its behavior. So in this case, it's sort of uninteresting for our purposes today what this attribute is doing, but notice its structure. Something equals quote unquote something else. And this is another difference with HTML. Those of you who are familiar, HTML doesn't really care if you quote things. It just cares that you do something equals something. XHTML requires that any values in this kind of attribute value pair do get quoted, either with two double quotes or two single quotes. You just have to be consistent. Doesn't matter which. But now that we've told the browser, hey browser, here is a web page written in not HTML, but XHTML, here comes the head of my page. There's two parts to a web page structurally for our purposes. The head, which is hard to depict other than to say it's pretty much the title bar up there. And we'll see some other stuff going there soon like CSS and JavaScript. But then the body is the real essence of the page, everything you actually see in the confines of the window. But in the head, we might have a title. So this says, here comes the head, all right, here comes the title. Because I close that tag with the right bracket, Everything in there is actually what appears in the title of my page. And now this says, hey, browser, that's it for the title. Stop displaying stuff in the title bar. We're done with the head, so hey, stop thinking of everything as being in the head. But here comes the body of my web page. So body now has an attribute that makes a little more sense, even if it's a bit cryptic. BG color is probably uh, affecting the behavior of the body of this page in what way? the background color. Uh, so you'll quickly get accustomed to these kinds of things. This is a hexadecimal code. Those of you who are familiar with the notion RGB, this is how much red you want displayed. This is how much uh, green G you want to RG. Yep. And this is how much blue RGB. Yeah. Red, green, blue, how much blue you want displayed. And they can be numbers from 00, zero up to FF. And those of you with prior programming experience hopefully have prior hexadecimal experience. Even if you don't, it's not a big deal. Charts on the web abound. But 00, zero denotes how much red? Take a guess. None, right? No red, no green, no blue. And uh, in the world of light, at least, the absence of any colors is really black, which is why we had a big black background to MalinRouge.com. If I wanted to make this thing a bit uglier and really crank up the light settings to FF, 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 and now reload this page. Now, I could re-upload this file to the web server, but that's really an unnecessary step, especially since I don't want the world seeing this version. So one of the things you can do throughout this course is you don't need to develop your pages on, in your domain on our server. You can just do it on your desktop. Because watch, in fact, what happens if I just double click a text file that I made with Notepad or this slightly fancier program that I downloaded called TextPad, which just has nice color coding like this. If I double click that, Notice what opens. Well, it's not the World Wide Web. It's just a file containing XHTML that lives on my hard drive. But for development purposes, at least for now, before we get to PHP, because most of you won't have PHP installed on your computers unless you want, 
we can see the changes. Now let's change it to something else. If I want to make it all red, what do I want to do? Yeah, you can kind of guess from the RGB triple. Ah, it's getting even uglier, right? Which is why I went with just black. So we'll leave it at that. All right, so now what else is going on here? So the body of my page is apparently going to be affected by this attribute value pair, changing its color. There are some other things you can change, but I would defer to most any online resource to see the list of options for many tags. It's not all that fun or interesting to memorize them. But a div is a popular concept we'll see throughout the course. This makes like a conceptual and an aesthetic division of the page. Think of this as laying out a rectangle into which all of the subsequent content will go. Well, this rectangle is apparently going to have its contents centered, though there are even other ways to do that there. And then this tag that's inside of this division of the page is apparently going to be an image whose source is malinrouge.jpg. Now notice there's really no notion conceptually of starting an image and then stopping an image, because you really can't do anything in between conceptually. So that's why this is one of these empty elements. But if I had left this off, that would be an error of validity. That is, that's no longer valid XHTML, or in fact, rather, that's an error of well-formedness. This page is no longer well-formed, so to speak, because the things I opened are not now all closed. So beware things like that. But I'll show you in a moment a tool with which you can check as much. So why is this thing centered? Well, it's because that attribute, if I just change it to left, we can see the effects there. If I change it to right, you can see the effects there. Um, and that's about as interesting as it gets, at least for now. Though there is this other language we can use. And this is actually a good segue known as CSS. So increasingly intertwined with web pages these days are not just tags like this, but what's called cascading style sheet language. So CSS is what allows you ever more so these days to go that final mile and really fine tune the aesthetics of your web page far more than just XHTML itself allows. So just to make this more real, let me note that even though the background of my whole page is now uh, uh, black, I'm going to actually stylize this div element and change its background, not to be confused with BG color, unfortunately, the names are sometimes inconsistent, to uh, red as before. So now notice what's happened. So I've aligned the whole image on the right, but remember that a div makes a big rectangular division of the page that's as wide as the page is wide and is, tall, is as tall as whatever's inside of the div. So notice that if I've aligned my image on the right, which I happen to manually with Photoshop put some black borders around, then the div itself is all red. It just so happens that this image is on top of half of it. And so this part here is still red. You can do yet other things still here. Uh, if I want to create a border, I can say a border of 10 pixels that's white and solid. And notice that all I've done here is I have one property that I specified inside this style attribute. And I have another property separated by it with a semicolon, but still within that same pair of double quotes. If I go ahead and reload this, notice now I have a 10 pixel border around the whole thing. Now, you got to save yourself from yourself, because you can very quickly make very ugly web pages. <laughs> but this just suggests the kind of flexibility you have. And realize that I think some of the best instruction on some of these nitty gritty details is, frankly, just to pull up one of the online resources we have linked, or the recommended reading in Project Zero, what tonight is more about is just instilling some of these principles. Like, what's the idea of an attribute and a value? What's CSS? Well, it's these combinations of property, colon, value, semicolon, property, colon, value, that allow you to fine tune the web page. We're not going to expect, though, rest assured in this course, works of art. We're going to expect correctness and things that are clean and code that is well written. But if, frankly, your perfectly implemented page comes out looking hideous like this, proud though you may be, that's actually fine. Right? This is ultimately a course for programmers, not so much about web designers. If you're good at both, wonderful. Uh, we'll be recruiting uh, next, uh, for next fall. But for now, we're going to focus on the program aspect of the course, building the websites and not necessarily on Photoshop skills and design sense, since I, frankly, lack uh, both. So. Where does that leave us? Well, let me turn us back to here, which is that sample example of uh, XHTML, and mention the following, only because we all type it most every day or let our browsers type it for us. So XHTML or HTML is the language in which web pages are written 
So what's with HTTP? Well, that thing you've been sort of likely blindly typing for years is just telling your browser what language, what protocol to speak when requesting web pages. So specifically, when you request a web page from a web server, even though you only type in, uh, we have all colors of chalk and no erasers. OK, we have. <laughs> When your browser makes a request of a web server, conceptually, yeah, it's requesting the default home page or whatever the URL is that you've explicitly specified. But what is it really sending, your browser, when you hit enter? Well, it's really sending an HTTP request, which usually starts with the word get, which then, after a space, specifies what it wants. So for instance, forward slash just means give me the default page, which, as we saw tonight, is often equivalent to a file called index.html. And then it specifies the version of HTTP, to HTTP that's in use, say HTTP 1.0. And there's usually some other stuff there. Most web browsers will also then say, oh, by the way, the host in question, even though I'm uh, contacting you with this generic IP address, the host that I really uh, am servicing for the user is mailinrouge.com. So each of these. Uh, this line here is an example of an HTTP header. And the deeper we get into PHP, the more of these things you'll see. For now, let's actually take a look at what Firefox is in fact doing when it requests a web page on our behalf. Well, I went ahead in advance of class via our software page on CS75.net, and I installed a plugin, free software, called Live HTTP Headers, which is a wonderful debugging tool, if nothing else. And it also, for those geeks in the crowd, really lets you see what's going on underneath the hood. And in a class like this, that's probably of interest to you. So this is a blank window. So I'm going to go ahead and not visit my index.html page, which doesn't require HTTP, because it's here. It's not on the internet. But I'm going to go back to the real mailinrouge.com and hit Enter. OK, I've pulled up the original undistorted un, uh, site. Now I'm going to go back to this and notice that what Live HTTP Headers has done, this Firefox plugin, is it has sniffed, it's logged everything that just went on behind the scenes between Firefox and the web server. So notice specifically, and it's a bit small, that the very first thing that Firefox did was that, get slash. HTTP slash 1.1. So it sent the HTTP-like message that I, pr I uh, promised that it would. It then sent that host line so that the server knows which of the potentially vir virtually hosted websites this user wants, and then some other stuff. So this other stuff for now, you can kind of infer, but this user agent line is proactively informing the server what browser I'm using for various purposes. But this is how websites log what the user's browser is, because this is being sent unbeknownst to them. There's some other stuff here, like what kinds of languages my browser is willing to accept in return. Am I willing to accept compressed web pages So for efficiency reasons, or do you just have to send raw data to me? Uh, connection keep alive. This is telling, telling the web browser, hey, it's going to be stupid if I have to ask you again and again and again on different socket connections for every image and every music file and every other embedded piece of data in a web page. So keep the connection alive, and let's just send them all in the same uh, transaction, the same TCP transaction, for those familiar. And then there's some more stuff, because turns out my page included not just text, but also what, obviously? that big image. So what a web browser does upon receiving XHTML or HTML is it parses it, so to speak, analyzes it, figures out what other files the browser is going to need in order to create the right user experience, and then it requests recursively or iteratively those same files. So notice that the second request sent by my browser, unbeknownst to me, was get forward slash mailinrouge.jpg HTTP slash 1.1. So all this is happening behind the scenes for me thanks to HTTP which is the language that browser and server speak to get the content from server to user. So we'll use this throughout the course, especially as we dive into PHP, so that you can actually see what's going on underneath the hood. What more can we put, though, uh, in these transactions? Well, CSS by itself for thus far has just been this notion of property colon value. Property colon value, separated by semicolons. Well, that very quickly becomes annoying if you have to embed all of your CSS in your XHTML 
via those style attributes. It'd be a lot nicer if we could sort of factor out some common stylization tricks, put them maybe in a separate file even, and then just tell various elements in your page, hey, use, uh, use the properties that make this centered, bold, and outlined with a white border. Right? If you have a bunch of different features you want to clump to cluster together and reuse again and again, it's useful to be able to define things at the top of the file just once. So one of the things you can do in a web page inside that head, uh, head element that I referred to earlier is not just the title of a page, but also a style tag tag, not attribute, up here inside of which can just be tag names and then these properties. Uh, uh, flanked in these curly braces. And again, this is just a teaser. We're going to focus on this first project mostly on XHTML, not so much on CSS. CSS, I think, is the sort of thing that you sort of pick up as you go when you actually have problems you want to solve and not just because you want to learn a new language per se. So for now, know that some of your stylization can be done here. So in this page, take a guess what this, the effect of this CSS is doing. Yeah, it's making the background, although it seems sort of half white, because we only have three letters instead of six. Turns out in CSS, for typing convenience, if you only type in three hexadecimal characters, it duplicates every one. So FFF is actually FF, FF, FF. And it saves you 50% as many keystrokes as you need to in XHTML. One other thing you can do with CSS, which we will do uh, for a few different reasons, is you can actually factor out all of your stylization and just put it in a separate file altogether. We do this, for instance, for the course's website, because if I want to change, for instance, the color of all of the links on our web page, it's a lot nicer if I can just go into one file, change one line, rather than open up every darn web page and do like a global find and replace. In fact, let's, let's try just this and see if I can uh, practice what I'm preaching. So here is cs75.net. We chose a lovely shade of blue for all of the links, borrowing the extension school's own choice of blue, which I figured out with Photoshop so that it's identical. But to heck with uh, identical stuff. Let's go ahead and go into my public HTML. Oh, I better become CS75. So let me go ahead and re-log into the server as the course's account. And now I'm going to go into that directory called public HTML. Obviously, there's way more content here than Malin Rouge already. So I'm going to go into a subdirectory I called CSS because I've put all of our CSS in this file. And it's a big site, so there's a lot, though frankly, some of this is probably outdated because I've discarded using that CSS. But the very top is the juicy stuff. So the color blue that we're using is 004990. Now, I didn't make that up. Photoshop told me what to type, so I went with that. But I want green now. So what's the code for green? 50% oh, fewer keystrokes, 0F0, zero zero, red, green, blue. Right? So I'm going to save the file. I'm going to go back to our web page. And those students who are at home right now checking out the website for the first time are really not impressed. So now the web page is this hideous shade of green for all of its links. But that, again, just suggests the power of using a style sheet to just factor out some of the stylization. You can make broad, uh, sweeping changes fairly easily. And we'll see some of that throughout the course, because in a sense, that is dynamic. Because you could use some JavaScript and also change things on the fly in that same spirit. Yeah? It is. You stole my. Oh, what is it? CSS. Uh, you stole my thunder, though. I was going to use this in a future lecture. But okay. CSS Zen Garden? Yes. Okay. So this site, and actually I haven't been here in a long time. What do I want to click here? The right hand links here? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, next designs? Will this work? Okay, so like here, dark rose. And it's basically all the same SCHTML, they just changed it only to CSS. Yes, okay. So it's all the same content. And this is probably best done at one's leisure when you can sort of focus on the text, because this is all, I guess, the same text. 
And so all of these changes are being done, to be clear, and it has been a while since I looked at this, just by changing CSS, not by changing any of those open tags and close tags. So increasingly, is CSS powerful? At least initially, we'll preach using it really just to sort of fine tune things, at least for those of you who have never used it before. Um, but there is some great power there. And increasingly, is it being used to lay out pages in, without using tables, which have been common for years to do things invisibly, which we'll get to at some point. Um, and you can do other neat tricks as well. Of course, you'll run into cross-platform issues, cross-browser issues even with CSS, which we may touch on as well. And back. Yeah, tell us to clarify uh, that they can each use their own images as well. You can also, you, right, you can also cite images within CSS. Oh, same with CSS oh you can, they can include their own images. Gotcha. Okay. So CSSZendarGarden.com. So final takeaway here is that if you don't want to just type all of your CSS within a web page there, you can actually just specify by way of a line like this what the file is called, as in our case, styles.css, containing that kind of CSS. So you've seen three different approaches. For now, the important takeaways for today are what tags are and what attributes and values are and generally how to structure a web page. And what the first sections will largely be about this week when we announce them by email. It'll be a little bit at the last minute so that we can hit the ground running as quickly as possible will be, for those of you uncomfortable with diving into this on your own, will be a bit of a tutorial, hands-on, um, so that you can uh, understand exactly how you can begin diving into this course. But those of you with more savvy and more experience with this stuff can presumably dive right in with the project as is. So I mentioned this word validity before. Fortunately, there are ways of checking if the code that you have written is at least syntactically um, correct and also cor correct with respect to the definition of XHTML. That is, if you would like, you don't have to read your file line by line, character by character, making sure that everything is perfect. Sometimes, frankly, the, your compiler, so to speak, is your best debugger. It'll just tell you what your warnings are. If I go to a website like this, which isn't actually a compiler, but just a script that checks the page, I can actually, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to go to cs75.net and see if the guys running this course are actually writing what's called valid XHTML, which is to say that the W3C, which is the volunteer organization that writes a lot of the standards for the web, including XHTML and HTML and the like, they wrote this validator that will just check, is this person's web page and all the XHTML they're in syntactically correct? That is, has every uh, attribute who's been quoted have a close quote? Does every tag that's been opened also been closed later and also symmetrically? All of those kinds of things. Uh, has the user used bogus tags? So popular 10 years ago was the blink tag. There's still some remnants out there. Not so good. It's not a valid XHTML tag. Even if you write open bracket blink close bracket, some words, open bracket slash blink close bracket, you can write it as perfectly as you think, it's still not a valid XHTML tag because it's not in the spec. We don't use that tag, though we will, you will see in the future how you can re-implement it with JavaScript if you really like Blink. And fortunately, the page is valid. It's tentatively valid because we've omitted what's called an XML declaration at the top of the page, which is this thing that starts with open bracket, question mark. And we do that because it confuses the PHP interpreter. And the simplest fix is just to ignore it because it's not necessary anyway. So what we're looking for in your pages is a nice green bar, no matter what, that says yay, but valid or tentatively valid is what we're looking for per the project spec. So what does? this all mean? Well, ultimately, when you have this account, you'll be able to write files on your local computer and upload them via SFTP or that nice uh, control panel interface. You can SSH, so to speak, to your account and start writing things here by using programs like VI and Emacs and Nano, if you're familiar. So ultimately, there are many different ways in which you can interface with the site, but know that, as I mentioned earlier, there's going to be issues. Not so much with your first project because it's fairly simple in scope, though maybe as well you'll see if you pull up your same website when you're just about done in multiple browsers, you'll wonder why in one of them your image is over here and yet in this other browser it's actually centered properly. You'll run into invariably stupid things like that, which will be up to you, perhaps with our assistance, um, to resolve before uh, submission time. A neat website, if you've not heard of it before, is someone spent the time writing a website that will automatically test your website 
on multiple different browsers and send you screenshots, it's not a perfect substitute for doing it yourself, especially since this course is about dynamic websites that have user interfaces. You're probably going to want to interface with your site when testing it. But if really you just want to care about aesthetics, maybe at that final minute, make sure that some browser that you don't have a copy of does display the site correctly. This is a pretty neat site for that sort of thing. But thankfully, there are some really smart and hardworking people out there particularly at Yahoo in this case, who have tried to simplify website designers' lives by leveling the playing field across browsers with libraries. So Yahoo's UI library, UI, offers a whole bunch of JavaScript code that we'll be looking at during the semester and CSS code. And simply by including a line that looks like this, it's a little long, but it's again one of these copy paste jobs, this will automatically tell your browser to use the CSS code that's not just locally on your uh, website, but also on yahooapis.com at that specific path. And the beautiful thing about UE's CSS stuff is that as this one suggests, reset min, they have figured out really by brute force what CSS tricks they can use to make sure that a table in Firefox looks identical to one on Safari and looks identical to one on Internet Explorer. Not IE 5.5, maybe IE 6 and 7, but on all of the major current releases. So I've started using this in all of the sites I do, frankly, because it just literally levels the playing field with blank pages so that they were all out of the box, in theory, look the same. The fonts. CSS file that we recommend and in Project Zero require that you embed just by copying and pasting this line will allow you to standardize the font sizes on all of your pages. So in yesteryear, if you wanted to change the sizes of fonts, you would say font size equals quote unquote, and then inside of that, you would put a number from one to seven. What the hell does one to seven mean? Like it wasn't point, it wasn't pixels. It was completely up to the designers of the web browser as to how to interpret one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. At least with CSS now, you can say things relatively like this. You can say style equals quote unquote font hyphen size, and then you can say small because. What you try, don't generally want to do is hard code font sizes or pixel sizes into websites for accessibility reasons. Right? There are certainly people that like to use their scroll wheel or the uh, font size menu in their browser and just make everything bigger because they don't like reading text that's this small. So if you start hard coding 12 point because it looks really nice to you, well, that's going to really alienate someone who just physically can't read that or just doesn't want to read it at that size. So it's nice to use relative sizes. But again, there's this catch-22. This catch so as soon as you go back to relative sizes, well, what does small mean? What does large mean? So what UE's fonts library does is they figure it out and they give you in their documentation at these URLs what percentages you can type in so that if you want 12 point, just write 33% for instance. And because of how they design their CSS, on any browser, any modern browser, will the user see that font size because of the tricks they have figured out on your behalf. So the final teaser for XHTML tonight is these things called forms. So the way in which we're going to make our websites dynamic for the most part is by actually taking input from users. Otherwise, it's not really a dynamic website if we're the only ones generating content, at least in some contexts. So how do you design something like Google, which has a search box and a submit button or an I'm feeling lucky button on it? Well, you just use these other tags. The input tag allows you to create a text field with syntax like that. That's one of those rectangular boxes that users, like in Google, can type words into. If you want a uh, password field where you get bullets instead of actual text, just say type equals password instead of text. If you want checkboxes, you'll start using things like this with project one, not with project zero. Radio buttons, male, female for a gender circle that you can check exclusively, use syntax like this. And drop down menus as well, can you actually give little drop downs just by implementing this XHTML? So, way more of that to come with Project Zero, which I'll conclude with our attention on. You will be tasked with the following one, some recommended but not required reading. Two, we will ask that you get a so called FAS account so that if you need to or want to, you can access the computers in this building, even though we won't use FAS as uh, servers for your own websites. We'll have you buying for just $9.99, or if you hurry, maybe $2.99, your own domain name. You can also get going on that tonight if you are just that excited. And then problems three and four on page. Uh, 
3, which is also zero index, so maybe I should just not mention page numbers at all, lest we confuse, uh, confuse everyone. Um, for CS50, uh, CS75.net, you will actually get your request of us, an account. We will reply as quickly as we can with your username and password, so you'll get access to the direct admin control panel and can get going and get your mom that email account. And then finally, in the, problem, in the project's last couple of problems, will you actually populate your website with something like I did here. It can be as vain as you want, it can be as generic as you want. We simply give you a few requirements at the site, really again to level the playing field so that two weeks time from now you'll be implementing not something quite like that, but maybe something that allows users to register, to log in, to check out, and do all sorts of crazy things. So with that said, I'll stick around for a while, but otherwise we will be in touch in a few days by email and see you next week.